Hey guys, it's John. Welcome to Whitewater Church. It's never been easier to invite somebody to Whitewater Church. Just copy the link or invite someone on Facebook. And stay tuned at the end for Whitewater Kids or click the link below to head there now. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the service. Whitewater friends and family, uh, welcome to a place you can belong before you believe, meaning you can explore faith at your own pace, uh, even if you don't believe what our church believes. We would just want to help people move forward on their journey toward Jesus. Whatever the next step is for you, we want to help. 
So we want to invite you to exploring the way of Jesus. We're going to jump into our second portion on the teaching of the story of Jesus, where four friends have carried their paraplegic friend to Jesus. The question we asked last week was, uh, who is going to be our stretcher bearer when we're uh, paralyzed and can't move? Who's going to carry us to Jesus when we can't get up? This week, we're going to be looking at uh, the barriers that they have to go through to get their friend to Jesus. Now, let's pick this up again. Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, Jesus went back again to Capernaum, where after a few days, word got around that he was at home. Now, a crowd gathered because they wanted to be around the healer, Jesus. He had started his ministry, was doing amazing things. And they, the crowd gathered so that people couldn't even get near the door as he was telling them the message, the message of the kingdom, the message of hope, the message of God's love. Verse 3, it says, Now a party arrived, four people carrying a paralyzed man, bringing him to Jesus. Now, they couldn't get through to him, that's Jesus, they couldn't get through to Jesus because the crowd. And so they opened up the roof above where he was. So they opened up the roof in the, in the ceiling of the building that Jesus is teaching in. When they had dug through it, they used ropes to let down the stretcher the paralyzed man was lying on. So... Here's the scene, and here's some of the cultural realities. I didn't, I didn't know this. This is kind of new information for, for me even. But this was probably Jesus' home. Jesus had probably moved from Nazareth, Nazareth to Capernaum, and this was probably Jesus' own home. So as Jesus is teaching in his own home, with it packed out, all these people wanting to be friends with him, this carpenter from Nazareth, this stonemason from Nazareth, who may have built this home, all of a sudden dust starts falling from the ceiling as he's teaching. You know, people, you know, they're like, well, weird things happen when Jesus teaches, you know, but it's just some dust. And all of a sudden more dust and the chunks of roof start caving in. And all of a sudden all this stuff falls to the floor and you can just see Jesus looking out as light is beaming in and there's four um, shaggy heads looking at him. And then this, this par paralyzed man is just lowered down onto the floor at the feet of Jesus. This is a, a, a carpenter mason seeing probably his own handiwork destroyed. But he sees these, these men and their compassion for their friend. I mean, no better demonstrated than the destruction of his own roof. This creative compassion has led these men to this moment. And I, I love that Jesus doesn't just see his ministry being disrupted, he sees his ministry being enhanced by a, a moment of real love. This is something, this is something to stop and, and pay attention to. So often in ministry, you know, when disruptions happen, you know, or the, our plans for what we want to be doing and, and God brings in a disruption, an interruption, so easy to just like want to move past it or be frustrated with it. You know, but Jesus doesn't, he doesn't just get, get frustrated with it. Although he does say, child, I forgive you. It kind of gives new meaning when you realize it's his, probably his own house. Um, but I love in this moment, uh, it, Jesus responds to the disruption. Now, I've been, I've been a pastor, you know, for, for a while now. And when we planted Whitewater Church, I remember being in a school uh, building and, um, and we had just a few chairs, and there were a few people. There weren't very many. And uh, it was at that time where you're like, God, is this church really going to get launched? Is this going to go? And I remember uh, in the middle of a sermon, I was making this great point. All of a sudden, I, I just heard this, and this splatter hit the ground. And a, and a baby threw up twice. There was the first episode, and I didn't know what to do, and so I kind of kept going. And then the second episode... All the chairs, you could, you could hear all the chairs, like these metal chairs, you know, just clamoring and moving and people like moving away from, you know, this mom and her child. And she was just sitting there patting, just still listening, you know, to this great point I was making. I just remember being like, uh, that baby just threw up. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray. 
Now I know what I should have said is like, child, I forgive you, <laughs> like Jesus did. Uh, but like the craziest interruptions can happen in the, in the middle of our lives, in the middle of ministry. I've heard it said that in a, how you react to an interruption reveals who you really are. And we're in a season where the roof has kind of caved in with, with COVID-19. It could be really easy to focus on the frustration the, the changed and, and halted plans and the, how it's ruined everything. But, but Jesus looks beyond that. He actually looks through the light and he sees uh, the love. He sees the opportunity to, to really help somebody and to grow. So in verse 5, which I've alluded to already, Jesus, it says, saw their faith. Whose faith? The paralyzed man? He's looking up at these men. He sees the faith of his friends, and said to the paralyzed man, child, your sins are forgiven. So he looks up and sees their faith, and then he forgives their friend. Now, it's kind of a weird thing. It's hard to explain theologically how the faith of these friends could cause this moment of forgiveness. But I think one thing that's important to to know about this culture that deeply ingrained in many at this time in in history, many would believe that he deserves to be a paraplegic because of some sin or some like sinful thought or behavior or attitude. Like there's got to be some reason. And that very likely has been internalized into this man. And so saying you're forgiven it's, it's like actually reflecting the love that these guys have for him and is freeing him to believe that it, he's worthy of love and worthy of healing. Now, I, I'll save the healing for next week because I want to focus in on, on, on this moment with Jesus. I want to focus in on the barriers that they, they had to break through to get this man to Jesus. Um, there was a crowd. They couldn't get through it. So they were creative and they went to the, the roof. There's a roof up there. They just start tearing through. I mean, they just literally probably with their hands, maybe with some tools, I don't know, just started digging through a roof because they were determined to get their friend to Jesus. And um, they would not be denied. No people, no roof, uh, no barrier was going to keep them from getting their paralyzed friend to this to this healer named Jesus. They didn't know for sure if he was going to, they believed it could happen, and they were going to make sure that the opportunity was given to their friend. Some of us have friends who are paralyzed right now because of fear, grief, because of loss of job and finances and business, or just the change that COVID-19 has brought. And there are real barriers facing them right now, barriers that are keeping them from the forgiveness or from the grace or from the love of God. Like God loves them, but but the barrier is there for them. What's preventing you from being part of removing the barriers? Some of the most important things we do as Jesus followers is help remove barriers that are in front of other people. Um, the religious people were the worst at this. The Pharisees, later in the story, we'll see, they they, they almost love like putting up barriers or pointing out barriers that are too high and too big so that you can't you can't be loved by God and one of the most powerful things we can do as followers of Jesus is follow his example and remove those barriers or in this case the the power of the love of these friends they dug through the wall through the ceiling through the barrier they wouldn't let anything get between them and their fi- friend finding healing sometimes you got to carry your friend because they're paralyzed. Other times, you got to dig, smash through a wall, a barrier, a roof, whatever it is. You got to smash through it. And sometimes you have to like tenderly lower this person and hand them off to someone else who might have more skill or might have what is needed to help them. I just love this moment because it's like these men and there's Jesus, this carpenter, and they're in this like, you know, it's it's in it's in Israel, and you know they're kind of probably like rough and tumble uh, carpenters and fishermen and and families that are all there. And there's just this tender moment where they're laying their friend that's been laying in the stretcher a long time at the feet of Jesus. You know, I have some friends who 
they, they, their son became severely addicted to, to drugs. And they lost their son as they knew him to this addiction. And I am telling you, when there was an opportunity to bring him back to himself, this mother and this father just broke through barrier after barrier after barrier. I mean, they tore a hole in this roof and that roof to get them to this help and get them to this doctor and get them to, like, they didn't care what it took, what it cost. They were going to get their son the help he needed. They were going to help him find healing. If at all possible, their love was desperate. There's a desperate quality. Who in your life are you desperate to get to Jesus? And what walls or barriers have you allowed to be too big? What walls or barriers have you allowed to, to, to halt the progress? And are there any barriers within your human ability within your grasp that you can help knock down. Like we can't, we can't deal with all the barriers. I mean, that's why God sent Jesus, but we, we can break through some walls. Can I get an amen out there? I hope I hear some amens. So let me ask you a few questions. The first one is this. Who broke through the barriers to get you to Jesus? Sometimes we have to remember the barriers that have been broken for us so that we can see the barriers that need to be broken for others. Who prayed for you when no one else was praying for you to get through the barrier that you had? Who just loved you? Who confronted you or confronted others on your behalf? Who begged you or begged others? Who gave? Who served? Who would not quit and was totally determined, would not be denied so that you could be laid at the feet of Jesus? to find the healing, the hope, the forgiveness, the life that you needed. Who's doing that on your behalf right now? Maybe you're sitting with that person. Maybe that person's just a phone call away. I want to encourage you today. If you've had someone helping you or have helped you in the past and you would not be sitting where you're sitting, you would not be having the wholeness and health that you have and maybe you've got a ways to go in your life, but you are, you're farther than you were yesterday and last year or the years before because somebody cared to get you to Jesus. I want to encourage you, give them a call and thank them today. Show gratitude. Let your heart rest in that reality because I think that's an empowering reality because when, when we realize that other people have helped us, we all of a sudden have a fire to help other people that God has brought into our lives. Here's the other question. Who in your life needs your help to break the barriers to get them to Jesus? Who in your sphere of influence, your friendships, your workplace, like who has God specifically put in your life that you can help with barriers? Maybe they're religious barriers. Maybe they're feelings of unworthiness, like they, they're not worthy of being helped, worthy of finding healing. Maybe there's people who have given up hope. They've got the barrier of like, it's just not going to happen. And you, your job is to pray down that wall in their life. Maybe it's a physical thing. Like we have, uh, my wife had uh, chronic pain for years and we prayed and worked on it, went to doctors and we were trying to just knock down that barrier and it just seemed impossible. And at, point, at points we were like, this is never going to happen. My wife became hopeless. But there were people that prayed with us, and you know, it was just something we just kept trying and working on. And and her pain has not gone fully away, but but in the last year and a half, her 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 pain went fully away. When um, it was really after the birth of my my son uh, Wesley, and um, it's not full healing, but she's like 80 percent better than she was. We're so grateful to that. There might be people in your life, and they they're. they're you might be sitting here right now and you're in chronic pain and you're like, yeah, well, I wish that would happen to me. And you know, don't give up. Maybe this side of heaven, it, it won't be full healing like we would hope. But I, I just know God desires us to have wholeness. And he puts people around us to carry us when we're paralyzed and to break through barriers that we aren't strong enough to. I also, I've, I've heard of a, a, a gal who, 
went through a tragedy with her own her own children and a health problem with her own children. And as they worked through it, they racked up all this debt and she had to work through with insurance companies. How many of you guys had to work through that? I mean, it's that's hard. Been just uh just drowning in debt. And she was able to um to learn how to work and advocate for herself and get out of that debt and to hold companies and uh uh, insurance companies and um, hospitals accountable for their responsibilities. Well, after her ordeal, she felt it was her calling to become an advocate and help others who were swimming in medical debt and dealing with insurance and didn't have the maybe the capacity or ability. And she became like a a, a, a roof breaker. She became a barrier breaker for others, and she would break those barriers so that they could find the healing and hope they needed. So here's my last question for you is, how could you help that friend or those friends this week? How could you start praying, actively helping with your skill set, your ability, maybe just your force of will to start knocking down those barriers this week? We're in the middle of COVID-19, a pandemic we, like we haven't seen in 100 years. There are people who need your help to break down those barriers. I had one close personal friend lose his son to addiction. And his best friend would not let him sink into grief, crawl into you know whatever hole and just give up. And there was time after time where he sank into a deep depression. His friend called him every day, every day. His friend uh, sent him notes and texts. Uh, messages every day, showed up every time he needed him. Every time he had a hunch that his friend was uh, was sinking, and in the worst of ways when we're, we don't know what to do, like was sinking, and he was not, he was going to lose his friend. Um, this guy just would not give up, just kept knocking down those barriers. And in about a year and a half, the barrier to the heart just fully broke. Jesus came in, hope came in, and um, my friend would point to that guy and say, that guy saved my life. He brought me to the feet of Jesus. Wouldn't it be nice if the, the story kind of ended here, child, I forgive you, and, um, but there's more to this story. Let me, let me read you this. In verse 6, after Jesus says, my son or my child, uh, your sins are forgiven, How dare this fellow speak like this, grumbled some of the legal experts, Pharisees, religious leaders. Verse 7, it's blasphemy. It's an insult to God. Who can forgive sins except God? We're going to look at Jesus' answer to this religious objection next week. Guys, don't miss it.
multiplied. Hi, guys. Without you guys' generosity, we can't do the things we do in the community. And for those of you who want to start giving and everything, there's two ways that you can do it. One, you can donate online. Number two, you can just mail us a check. Now, for all you who want to do things in the community, we have quite a few things we can get you hooked up with. So send us a message and we'll get you hooked up. Man, we just think the teachings and way of Jesus is so amazing, but um, his teaching can't just be information. We, we believe that it, it needs to be transformation in our lives. So I wanna encourage you today with um, maybe someone uh, socially distanced and healthy for you, but maybe it's a, a family member or your whole family or your, your spiritual family. Would you just uh, go through these questions to help you really be thinking, what is God saying to me about this area of my life? And here's some of the questions just to go through. First is who broke through those barriers to get you to Jesus? Who is the, who is the barrier breaker for your life? And how could you thank them like this week, like today, whether it's a phone call or a letter, how could you thank them? Next is who in your life needs your help to break through barriers to get them to Jesus? You know, pray about that. Who has God put in your life? What faces come to mind? And how could you help them this week? We love you so much. Go ahead and click on Whitewater Kids and uh, have a great day. We'll see you next week.